Um, I hope you're, you've enjoyed last night and um, the time so far. I, I want to share with you a few things about this thing called FontLab. And of course, um, there's been this traditional thing on type conferences in the last couple of years that um, people were asking, so yeah, this FontLab 6, when is it going to be released? Well, fortunately, I can report that we have released it a few months ago, and actually, we've been releasing regular updates. Uh, yesterday, we published FontLab 6 version 605. Um, we're fixing bugs, we're adding um, features that people request. We also add, we, we are adding a few things that, well, we thought up, but they didn't make it into the initial release. So it's, it's very steady and it's very, it's, it's super exciting because, you know, right now it is, um, well, it consumes a lot of my time and of course my colleague Yuri and the rest of our team. And it's really great to, you know, to, to see the people's reactions. It's no longer public preview. It's now sort of shipping and developing. And today, because I think um, variation, variable fonts are still um, kind of like a large piece of the focus here at Typo Labs, I want to um, talk to you specifically about variable fonts and variation support in FontLab 6. There's tons of other things that I won't cover here, but we have a session on the second floor at 12, Yuri and I, so if you have specific questions, please come to see us at noon, and we're going to be looking more in depth into FontLab 6 variable stuff, but also other aspects. Uh, so, um, yeah, so the variations, the VI, of course, or 6, of course, it stands for variations included, or maybe not. Uh, there, was a, there were many different uh, versions of that uh, abbreviation, but um, today it's variations included. And uh, before mm, um, I go into the topic, I want to mention that we've just um, started a few days ago, uh, kind of because of Typo Labs, a special sale. So you can get, until the coming Tuesday, you can get FontLab 6 at a discount of 33%, or if it's upgrades or educational, 20% off. So um, just because, you know, we just pushed an update and we thought, okay, let, let um, people uh, have fun with that. How many of you here um, used or tried either a trial version or have bought a license of FontUp 6? Oh, cool. That is like a large majority. So I think you know some of the things. So I'm going to be mentioning a few things that are new um, in the recent release, uh, 605, but also relating to, um, to variations. So first, Let's have a look at how um, you can kind of make a very, very quick and dirty version of a variable font from static sources. So if I have, I have this is Source Sans Pro, I have three um, OTFs. Um, when I open them in FontLab 6, I can drag them to the sketchboard. Um, I select the fonts in the fonts panel. I say merge to masters. I close the other fonts, and I have a variable font with three font masters. I'm going to be explaining a bit more what font masters are in six specifically, but um, just very simple fonts panel, select the fonts you have, merge to masters, and then um, basically you can um, you can try the interpolation, and generate an open time variable font. And it 
runs using uh, font tools varlib and builds it and there you go we have a weight axis because fontlab has inferred automatically that the uh, fonts differed in the weight style attributes um so so this is a this is a very very quick process to you know to test to start without setting lots of parameters just to figure it out how how it works as a as a kind of um as a very simple uh, variable font without much um, customization. But one of the things that's missing here are the predefined instances. So we have the slider in font view or elsewhere, but of course, in order to add predefined instances, we would need to, to do a, a few more steps. So first, we're going to actually add an axis. That's an explicit axis definition of the weight axis. Um, so now FontLab is no longer inferring that there is a weight axis, but we define it explicitly. And because there's a special syntax, I'll show it again, um, and we can delve into it um, at our workshop. The point is, within an axis, you can kind of define your map for instances and then um, in the instances section of the font info, you can say, okay, build me the instances I want, of course, instance definitions. Um, if I export the font now, open type variations, it remembers the last format you exported, and it builds, um, you can see that now there are predefined instances in addition to the slider. So that's, um, that's a f slightly uh, more complicated, but still fairly simple, a way to build variable fonts. FontLab 6 infers when you merge fonts into masters. It looks at the style attributes, the weight class and the width class, the same as you know, US weight class, US width class in the OS2 table, and um, tries to map, kind of build like a on the fly virtual weight and width axis. But if you define them explicitly, then you can set the design locations and these US weight class or US width class values are no longer used. They're just like a starting point. So a bit less dirty way uh, would be to um, to to sort of fine-tune it a bit more. So here, this is the variations panel um, that we're looking at, and uh, there's a map view and the list view, and there is this little button. Uh, I'm going to just show it again, because you will notice that there was a, a problem in the letter Q, because it was built from, well, exported final fonts that may not necessarily have been completely compatible. Specifically, I think they, they differed in the start point. Uh, so these two buttons in the variations panel, and also they correspond to settings in uh, font info, um, they allow you to control whether it should be completely blind interpolation as it is, or whether FontLab should attempt a little bit of kind of magic. So it, uh, there are two buttons. One is for sorting contours. The other is called check geometry, and it does a few more uh, other things. It corrects the start point locations. It also uh, corrects the... Um, um, it looks at sort of angles and, uh, and tries to figure out, okay, what is, you know, if you have a rotated um, circle, it would detect that, that there is this kind of um, implosion going on and would automatically fix it on the fly. And with these settings, if you press the, if you choose match masters, which is an operation, um, FontLab will kind of bake this correction directly into the glyph. And here you can see again what's going on. This is without this automatic correction and you can see how the nodes in the queue are flipping. But with the correction, mm, the interpolation is uh, smooth. 
So this is with the check geometry button, and this is sort of what came out straight of merging the fonts into, into the masters. Mm, and of course, FontLab can open true type flavored variable fonts uh, with some limitations, but basically um, the GX variations or GVAR fonts, um, even FontLab Studio 5 was opening them and we sort of fixed a few things, so now this is more compatible. So when you, when you build a variable font, you can then open it and test you know, what actually came out. And this will be true type outlines and exactly the, um, the setup that, uh, that was found in the font. So now let's have a look at uh, something more step by step. This is, um, I have three UFOs um, here and I open them. If there was a design space file, you could open the design space uh, file directly, but since there are just three UFOs, I need to, I pick one font and uh, add a weight axis. Mm, I, and then I, um, I turn off this automation because the fonts are already compatible. And um, I add the master from the other font, existing open font, first the thin font, then the black font. So I now, uh, in the sort of the font that was previously single axis or sorry, single master regular font, now has three masters. And here I have you know this merge to masters operation. Basically, you select a bunch of fonts, and FontLab. Well, I wouldn't say picked randomly, but you don't really have explicit control over which font will be the main master and to that. Uh, which uh, the other masters will be added. So, so FontLab will just build a new font with these masters, but you're not really sure where the rest of the metadata, such as copyright information, etc., came from. With this method, if you pick one font and add the masters to it, the font global data will be kept from the font that, that you started with. Um, so, Mm. Now I'm going to um, reposition, I look at the stems, that uh, vertical stems that, uh, um, that the masters have and reposition the masters on the design space using these numbers. This is a, you know, a convention that many people use to sort of associate um, the axis location with some, something real, like for instance uh, stems. So I've, I've edited um, the axis locations, and I'm just fixing up some names so they show up differently in in the in the user interface. And I have three masters, mm, thin, regular, and black, that sit on a design space um, on the weight axis. The weight, uh, excuse me, ah, yeah. Um, the axis, this, this, these axis instances, as we call them, um, these are sort of definitions of the stops uh, along each axis. This is the info that you would go into the stat table if you, um, if you uh, know the open type vari variable fonts. And you can define how these um, stops specifically for the weight axis, how the US weight value will correspond to the design location. So th there is this simple notation, um, the name, a style attribute name, US uh, weight axis equals the design location. And then max minimum and maximum are kind of the um, the bounds uh, used only within the FontLab 6 user interface to kind of limit how much the sliders go. So you can extrapolate, uh, but you know if you put your design axis, uh, sorry, your masters at the design location from 17 to 226, and the default scale would go from 0 to 1,000, then basically the styles on the right-hand side, uh, the extrapolation would be huge. So you can limit the minimum and maximum 
of the extrapolation allowable in the user interface using the access panel. Um, okay, so now we have now we have these masters. Um, they have their design location and um, let's. Um, Ah, yeah, okay. There is, um, I'm showing here kind of, because I, I want to add more. I have three masters, but I would actually want to make a condensed. So I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna use, use the knife tool to kind of cut through the places where I'm gonna later insert um, straight segments. So there, be, uh, there will be interpolable. So it's sort of cutting edge in a sense. Well, the knife tool has different um, abilities. You can either cut and open the contours so that they're, um, they're um, broken, or you can just add the nodes. In this particular case, I'm just adding duplicate nodes on top of the existing ones. Mm. And well, if I convert, it created tiny curve segments. If I convert them to line segments, then you will see these in indicators that these are kind of empty um, or duplicate nodes. So I have added them here, and now I'm going to try... Oh, yes, sorry. Um, that, that was... Nope. So um, because I've added these nodes to one master, I need to... I need to now make the other two masters, thin and black, compatible. So for that, there are operations that we call matching the masters, and there is a there is an automatic one. There is also a tool uh, called the Matchmaker tool, which works like this. This is a um, another example. This is um, a font with seven masters, where it kind of you can see these lines, these master connections are very, very incompatible, and there are different segments that have different no, uh, numbers of nodes on them. You, s you work in sort of sections. You say, okay, this is the beginning of the section, this is the end of the section, and harmonize these um, sections as uh, well as you can. I'm going to play it again. This is, you know, these are the original masters. You can see that. Some of them have these extra points, some not. I, s I mark the, all the points from all the masters for a start of a section, end of a section, click, and then FontLab tries to harmonize these, uh, these sections, which could be just one segment or a series of segments, um, so that pretty quickly you can uh, arrive at a um, matching or compatible outline. In this case, um, because I have these duplicate nodes on one master and uh, none on, on the other ones, I'm going to use the Matchmaker tool to, um, to create them. Hmm? Oops. Sorry. Okay, I think... Um, nope. Okay, sorry. Something didn't work there. But my next goal um, is to, uh, to create a condensed master. So I have to set up, I have thin, regular, and black, and I want to, um, to make a condensed axis, or sorry, a width axis. Mm, so how would I do that? Well, first I'm going to add the axis in font info. Uh, font up suggests width as the second one, and... Um, Add a duplicate the, ma the regular master, um, change some parameters, make it, you know, call it condensed, um, and then in the master's setup, um, set the design location of that master at the width axis 75 rather than 100. Um, I'm going to, again, limit the minimum and maximum uh, for the user interface. And now I have a condensed master, which is identical to the regular master. It just has the information, okay, its design space location is 75. <coughs> mm. 
So um, I'll just pick a few glyphs to show you how you would, well, actually make the condensed out of this regular for, for some glyphs. We're going to use, I will enable this edit across uh, glyphs functionality so you can sort of see the nodes and also uh, move and edit the nodes for m multiple glyphs at a time. And I'm going to be using Power Nudge. Power Nudge is kind of like a switch that um, enables this functionality where when you move certain nodes around, FontLab tries to figure out which uh, not only handles or BCPs, but also which on-curve points or nodes should be interpolated when you move. And I'll, I'll just show it how it, uh, I'll just show you how it works. So here, in case of the A glyph, I'm selecting some of the nodes and also without these handles. Um, I turn on power nudge and I you know, move the contour, move these nodes, and you see that the font lab sort of guesses which points should be interpolated. Um, So this is a fairly, you know, quick process, um, and of course it's not like the, you know, you would need to to do a lot of more more work, but this sort of allows you to uh, to get certain scaling results um, much faster than in 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 well Studio Five, and also because I'll just show it quickly again, because, um, so here in this case, I'm selecting the BCPs um, in addition to the nodes, because I want them not to scale, or not to interpolate, it's my decision. And here, because um, there are a couple of elements, shared elements used in this bowl, is used in the glyph B, but also in the D, P, and Q, you can see that at the bottom in the preview panel, that they already have been scaled, because this is the same element, just uh, rotated or uh, mirrored. OK, so, um, and this is here an example of, you know, how Power Nudge um, would, sometimes requires, well, a decision of which points you actually want to select. So I'm going to first show um, the effect with just selecting the outer extrema and then also some some uh, nodes inside. So this is, you can see that that bit where it connects with the bowl, um, that probably shouldn't be interpolated. So I want to I wanna select really the nodes that, ah yeah, these two, yeah, that looks, that's better. Um, so the ones you select will be moved explicitly the ones you don't select, FontLab figures out which should stay in place and which should be interpolated. Um, okay, well, now I've made this condensed master for just a few glyphs. So I have, um, I can now explore, I can look at these masters and I can also um, um, yeah, if I switch to the text mode, I can navigate instead of just the preview panel in the main window using the variation panel so you can look at, at how the interpolation works between these masters. But because of the variation model, I can also extrapolate the corners, right? So I only have a condensed master for the regular, but a mutator math. Uh, creates um, the condensed, well, so condensed uh, thin and condensed black um, by adding the movements, the movements toward the black and the move from the regular and the movements toward condensing. They're added, combined, and you kind of magically have a black condensed and light condensed master. Um, in some cases, it 
you know, the result is fine. In other cases, you would probably start off with this extrapolation and then add an explicit master and do corrections there. Mm, okay, so uh, let's add another axis. I'm going to add uh, the ascender axis, which is not predefined, so I'm going to uh, type the name, the two-letter code, which is used internally, the four-letter uh, open type variations tag, and um, some... Yeah, okay, so ascender in this case is 760, the font info defined ascender, so I'm going to put it as the standard position, the maximum 1,000, the minimum 500, and just delete these uh, access instances, they're not needed or required, they're, they're optional. Mm. And now I, I go to this, the location, I copy uh, this, this numeric, sorry, this list of design locations, because what I'm going to do, I've just selected the B and the D glyph, and I'm going to add glyph masters rather than font masters. Font masters, which are valid for the entire font, they're managed in font info. But glyph masters, um, you can uh, insert uh, additional glyph masters in, in uh, design locations using the add layer functionality. For the selected glyphs, these are B and D. And here, for the ascender lo location, I'm saying it's going to be 840. Mm. Oh, yes, and I need to prefix that with the colon. Uh, so colon in the layer name. Uh, means what follows is the design location of a glyph master. And you use the same syntax as uh, this design location syntax for the font master, it's just a much simpler GUI. So I've added that so you can see it's colon AS840. Um, so that's otherwise. So now I have two glyphs which have this extra glyph master, at this point identical to the regular. Mm. Oops. Sorry. Ah, yeah. Okay. Sorry, I skipped too early. Mm. Right. So I'm adding a font guide in uh, this Glyph Master. Mm, with shift dragging it from the ruler, then it becomes a font guide, placing it um, at the uh, top. I'm also adding um, a baseline font guide. You could use baseline specifically, but I don't want to mess with the baseline. And I'm using the magnet tool to attach some nodes to these two font guidelines, in this glyph and also in the D. So I, I grab, I select the points, and I attach with the magnet tool to the baseline, uh, sorry, to the font guides. And now, well, I can, you know, I can adjust uh, this one font guide, and if it, everything that I've attached to will follow the change. And uh, since I have now two masters, glyph masters, I can interpolate between, you know, the two ascender, the normal ascender, and the long one. And I've only made this extra master for the glyphs I need. Um, however, I must say that the glyphs master right now aren't yet included if you build a OT variable font. This is something we, we need to look at. Right now, it, they, they work if you generate an instance. So if you, if, you, if you generate an instance, these will be included. The, the, the OTVAR export doesn't support them yet, but um, we, we, uh, I think one of the next builds should, um, should support that as well. Okay, so another sort of axis maybe. So I'm just adding these axes, so I'm going to add another one um, called tension, come up with, a, with some... Um, because they're unregistered, of course, the, then I'm, I'm coming up with an all uppercase four-letter axis tag. Mm. And uh, this time, uh, 
I'm going to do it differently. I'm going to make these glyph layers as sort of like a backup copy. So maybe I'll delete them afterwards, but I, um, I put colon and the design location. So, and then I'm, I'm, I'm saying, okay, this these is the, uh, the sort of original tension that I wanted. Um, I could interpolate between that what I have and that what I will create, but maybe I actually will discard them. So this is sort of like a working uh, copy of a glyph layer. And now, because I've added these cuts, as you remember, I, well, I will sort of, um, I will put some font guides. Now, because these nodes are on top of each other, when you want to select them, um, it sort of matters from which, uh, ah, that was wrong. So, it matters from, um, from which sort of side of the node you, you approach the node, then either the top or the, the, the right one will be selected. So I come from the top, and now I know that, uh, that, these, um, that these that belong to the top segment will be selected. Um, this is, you know, nodes on top of each other, selecting them properly was always difficult, and I thought we arrived at a nice solution. So you just come to the mouse along the segment, and then it catches it. Okay, so I've created these straight segments. Now I'm, uh, and uh, by the way, sorry, I, um, I wanted to also mention that here I'm using control alt as the modifiers when I will be moving them up and down, which means this is the, the traditional nudge. So it, uh, okay. Do it again. Yeah, so I'm selecting these. And now I'm using a control alt. And you will see that the BCPs, the handles, interpolate uh, slightly. So this is what was called interpolated nudge as a macro. And here, alt control plus shift because I want to also constrain the movement. Uh, vertically, so it's Alt, Control, and Shift, and now I'm going to press only Alt and, sh uh, and Shift, or just Alt, to keep the BCPs in place and just move the nodes. So effectively, I kind of reduced um, the this long segment, a straight segment, to make it a bit more of a pleasing shape. So first, nudged the nodes up so that the BCP is interpolated, and then move the nodes down again, leaving the handles in place. And, well, this is... I will also, now I can go to nodes detect smooth, and it will automatically detect, ah, these are actually, this could be converted to tangent nodes. Um, and uh, now I, I, I select some segments and uh, do edit tuning lines. Tuning lines are these ways to control the segment tension. I've just selected the few segments I want to control using tuning lines and uh, move them up and down with the arrows. Then maybe convert them to uh, Genius, so G2 Ultra Smooth doesn't really look very well, but I can, so I undo that and, uh, you know, look at, okay, maybe I'm going to adjust the tension of these segments using tuning lines again. So it's um, Alt-Command-L, and now I can use the arrow keys or the mouse to, to adjust and follow the preview panel, if you so will. Now with Alt, I just move the nodes between the BCPs, um, maybe adjust the tuning lines again to sort of, you know, find the right sort of slightly more square, uh, square version of this condensed. And, uh, yeah, I would, I would do the same to, 
Ah, okay. I would do the same to the O and uh, follow through with the glyphs that, um, that I, I want to control. Okay, so, so these are, you know, these are a few of these operations that we've, um, we've tried to optimize somehow in the design work, though, because they're, they're very, very common, right? I'm, I think many people agree that um, the Bezier handles as kind of two points that you, can, that you can move independently or maybe one needs to go up and the other actually needs to go right in order to, for the segment to become, to get more or less tension, that this is um, a bit weird because actually what you want to control often is the, you know, the shape of the segment and not necessarily the position of these BCPs. So with Tooney lines and, um, um, and also the power nudge, regular nudge, and just moving the, uh, the nodes independently of the handles, or also, of course, selecting multiple handles at the same time using Alt with the lasso tool. And there's a preference that also allows you to always, you know, using the regular marquee, either you can set font lab so that it selects both nodes and handles, or you can change it so that regular marquee only selects nodes, and the lasso tool, so Alt in selection, Select also um, also handles. Okay, so um, then there's there's uh, there's some more um, interesting tools, and that have to do with you know working with closed versus open contours. So of course, the area that is filled um, well needs to be contained within a contour, but does but sometimes these corners, for example, are not really very practical to adjust if they're represented in the final form that goes into the font. So here we have this letter C with uh, three masters, and I'm going to... Um, I'm going to enable um, the view of all the layers on top of each other, with the option edit across layers and um, turned on. And now I can click on the segments and unlink, uh, say unlink corners and do the same on the bottom. So you can see that it's still, um, it still interpolates well. Uh, there's a problem with this flipping. I'm going to correct it by, uh, by enabling, uh, enabling um, check master's geometry. And now I have this letter C that is a bit more free form because I can, uh, I can now control um, Oh yeah, this is a, just a, the, the preview, sorry, the variations panel has these little play buttons. Uh, in the list mode, which allows you to sort of dynamically look at how the interpolation goes along the axis. Mm. Also, there is this line that you can drag, and then it gives you the, the progression of the interpolation in a static way. I'm going to use that to, uh, to kind of play with this ultra bold uh, C. So since, um, since these contours are open, um, and FontLab knows oh, which area is to be filled because that's the intersection. That's the sort of fill tool which you can also use manually to fill and unfill certain areas. I can adjust much more freely um, using, you know, these these enclosing uh, boundaries. I can Alt Shift the final curve nodes. Uh, that's called slide. So here I'm just moving, but here I'm actually sliding. So it, the the node wanders along the the curve that is that is defined. Uh, that works also within contours. So you can kind of slide the node to a different position. And uh, yeah, I've fixed up the. I've changed the uh, the structure of the C, the terminals, um, in a much more sort of independent and easy way than it would be. Uh, with sort of final outlines, and of course, yeah, I can, 
I can also do some adjustment to the condensed master, do the same, Alt, Shift, drag these nodes so they slide, now select just the handles uh, using Alt Lasso, and now I can, again, um, change a portion of the curve without uh, influencing the, uh, the, straight, uh, the, the, the straight part. So these become independent, but they still interpolate. Because if these open contours are kind of point compatible, what is being interpolated are the final filled outlines. So you have this kind of more control over how the, you know, where you put your control points um, with an open contour. But of course, the interpolation is still being done on that what is black, so to speak. Mm, okay, and then we, we get to just instances. Um, maybe I want, since I've added lots of axes now, or in this case, they, I only have, I think, I've went back to, yeah, just width and weight. Here, I'm defining my progression along uh, the width axis. So I'm saying, okay, my master, condensed master was 75, the normal was 100, I'm adding another one at eight, 82, a semi-condensed, and I push this button from axis, I got a list of instances that were automatically generated by combining all the stops along the weight uh, axis and all the stops along the width axis. So instead of, you know, defining, I don't know, 80 instances, if I I can have eight stops on the width and 10 on the weight. Just push a button and I got the combination of those. And if I don't like something, I can change it easily and regenerate. This, of course, this works, this automation works if the, the model is kind of rectangular. And um, I'm building a variable font uh, from this setup. So these are predefined instances, but I can also uh, export as OpenTypePS, pick uh, PostScript, pick Instances tab, and now FontLab is building static fonts from the same instances map. So I have a variable font with these funny experiments I did on the C. So um, the black master, uh, the black version looks a bit odd. I have these predefined instances here uh, from the variable font. And, oh, yeah, sorry. And there were also the, I just, there were also the open type fonts that were generated in one go. Of course, it takes a little while, but uh, still pretty fast, the interpolation and, you know, building these instances. You can, in font info, you can, um, enable and disable, and also during export, uh, certain instances that you may want to export or not. So it's, you know, you don't have to export all the instances you've defined all the time. Maybe you want to pick just three or four, keep exporting them while you're testing, and then you select them all and build a larger static family uh, when you're kind of ready to ship. Mm. Yeah, so this is, you know, this is variable stuff, and I wanted to just show you um, to, to kind of um, to close this on a, on a slightly different note. I wanted to, um, to show you uh, um, um, a bit of the color font, the color font stuff, because, of course, this is the other um, area that is, oh, well, I don't know how the market will react and you know we have these formats and um, I wanted to show you how how the process might be you know some people may have drawn full color letters in a different app like an illustrator so here this is a this is a design that um, was done in illustrator as the set of you know uh, of um, colorized 
uh, glyphs that one is supposed to kind of assemble and copy paste together. Mm. I will copy them onto the sketchboard, which is this canvas area paper in font up six. I um, optically separate them so separate elements are being formed. Now I drag a guideline and I um, shift drag it to make it a thick guideline, something like a hint, um, and call it C, so that will, that will serve as a measurement. This is the caps height I'm telling FontLab. Now I'm duplicating them and basically making sure that FontLab knows, you know, where are, what is the scale of these letters. And um, I make a new font, um, define the size that I want for the caps height, select these elements and say place as glyphs, selected elements, and there you go, I have, um, you know, I have them all converted to, to glyphs and they're even automatically auto-spaced in this particular case when you place them from the sketchboard. So then I could, you know, repeat the same thing, uh, maybe um, for the digits and for the lowercase. Um, so here again, I'm assigning them uh, the encoding and do the same for, for the lowercase. And I can, you know, I can kern, I can uh, typeset something within using the text tool, which also allows you to um, I can uh, I can edit some elements. I can um, um, well change the color and um, adjust the spacing. And then either I can say export window contents. Uh, as PDF, and then I, I, you will get the rendering of the inside of the window. So it's kind of like a little typesetter, test typesetter. Uh, or I can export as a um, open type SVG color font, which um, then if placed into the uh, Adobe font folder, should work, yeah. So this is this is the font I just you know generated from FontLab six. So also a fairly simple process. Trying you know us trying to help you as much as you can with with uh, tedious steps and well not replacing <coughs> the actual design work, but trying to replace as much of these repetitive steps. Um, and uh, yeah, this is this is it uh, for me. Again, if you haven't gotten uh, the license, it's you've got a few days where it's um, thirty-three percent off or upgrades twenty percent off. So, so um, that's a nice thing. And um, yeah, thank you. I hope. This was useful. If you have questions, um, I would suggest that we can meet at uh, noon um, upstairs. Uh, maybe we have, I don't know, time for like one question or something like that, or otherwise um, I welcome you to the workshop session later at noon. Well, thank you.